Okay, guys, welcome back. We've got another amazing legend of a guest on today. We've got the uh, phenomenal Eddie Elwood, pro bodybuilder, strong man, probably a load of other things, which we'll, we'll get on to at some point. How are you doing, Eddie? I'm fine, thanks. Brilliant. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you for having us on. No, absolute pleasure, sir. So what we wanted to start with, if we could, what we're doing, we'll hopefully get you back on, Eddie, because we're going to do... A bit of a group one with Ian Harrison, okay, yourself, be and because uh, we thought that would be really good and they're really up for that. Yes. Um, but on this first one, what we normally do is we just try to just talk about you as much as we can. So just like how your career started, you know, how you yeah. got into bodybuilding. So if we could just start with that, how you started. I think most, I think most people have heard it, but I'll, I'll, I'll tell you it again. I'll tell everybody it again. Yeah. My first, uh, my first love was boxing. Okay. Started at the young age of um, 12 as a schoolboy. Okay. Uh, I had 55 amateur fights up till the age of 19. Okay. Uh, I was due to fight in the junior, sorry, in the ABAs as heavyweight. <clears throat> and Sorry, at, at light heavyweight. Okay. So when I actually got to weigh in, I was two pound over the light heavyweight limit. Okay. Which, it was about 12 stone 10 or something. It wasn't very heavy. And I didn't have the time to lose the weight, so I had to box at heavyweight. So I was given a lot of body weight away at 19. I was still uh, a young boy, really. Um, okay. So I got through the area finals, and I boxed a, a good guy called um, Manny Burgo in the area finals and got beat on a majority, which was two to one votes. Okay. Uh, that was only a light heavyweight. <clears throat> and um, I came away from that fight and I said to myself, right, I'm going to start weight training and I'm going to start eating properly to gain a bit of tissue because obviously I'm eventually going to become a proper heavyweight. Yeah. And my father had always had gyms. <clears throat> my mother had always cooked good food. Um, so, you know, I, 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 was, I was at an advantage really for putting good body weight on because right. my, dad, my dad knew the weight training side. My mother knew the diet side. Um, but I was a very, very parky kid, you know what I mean? I, I, yeah. was, I didn't eat steak, I wasn't eating, I didn't eat healthily at that age, but I thought, no, I'm going to have to do it now. So I decided, what I decided to do was, it was the end of the boxing season in May, <clears throat> I decided to start training for a, a, a junior bodybuilding show in, in the October, yeah. just so I knew I'd put good weight on. Yeah. So I had six months training. Um, and I did a junior bodybuilding show and won. Um, right. And I just thought, oh, that was good. <laughs> <laughs> I'll do another one um, just to put the extra weight on. So I was only 13 and a half stone. So I started training for the area North Britain, and uh, NABA area North Britain. And the, the age limit for juniors for NABA is 20 or under on January the 1st, which right. I was. I was 20 on January the 1st. I turned 21 in the March. That still, still made me a junior. It was only my second competition. I was training for the area competition. Um, and when I, went to when, when I went to the competition, somebody had been spreading a rumour that I was too old. I didn't know this, but I'd been, you know, I didn't go prepared. I didn't take any passport or driving licence or anything. So the officials at the time said, apparently you're too old, you'll have to go in the novices. Well, it broke me heart because I wanted to do the juniors and I thought yeah. I could have won the junior title that year, you know what I mean? Even though yeah. I'd only had 10 months training, I thought I could have won the junior title that year. So, anyway, I did the novices and I got fifth at the first novice Britain I did. Right. Which spurred me on to do another competition. So I qualified to do, sorry, I did the, the show, I did the, my first junior show at the following year. I won the uh, overall Mr. Class. Right. So I've been training just over a year and a half, and I won the overall Mr. Class at this point right. of 14 and a half stone. And then I decided, well, I'm going, the boxing sort of got left behind, and I started. Then um, I won the, me, sorry, at my first tall class Mr. Britain, which was only two year in. I got fifth in the tall class Mr. Britain. Then I came back the following year and got second to Basil Francis at the NABA um, Tall Class Mr. Britain. Right. And then in 88, I won the Tall Class Mr. Britain, but fell short of winning the overall Britain. Right. Came back in 89 and won the overall Britain. Right. Um, 
and then I, it was it was a strange old time really because NAB has never been a very political organisation. I don't want to bore you at all, but it's, a, no, a, no. it's an interesting story because I was the only ever person to be banned by NAB. Strangely, it's strange that now I'm NAB international president. But at, <laughs> that time, at that time, I was banned by NAB for doing a guest spot for Wawa. Ah, right. And, and the reason and NAB has never banned anybody, but the reason was at the time was I always used to take massive support to me competitions. Like our gym used to take two busloads to Blackpool to the Britain finals. Right. We used to sell 150 tickets. Right. Uh, we had amazing support back then, you know. It was just a yeah. proper family atmosphere. There was me and yeah. my brother competing at the time. Yeah. We just had a, a ball at Blackpool and we, we, we like, you know, the, the I don't know if you remember the the... Foghorn deers, you know. Oh yeah, the best deers. Those, those. Those, you know what I mean. Best deers, those. Like, those were amazing back then. Yeah, they were. Um, and the atmosphere was fantastic. You know, you'd go to Blackpool. You'd have the night before the. Um, yeah, that's true. The event in Blackpool. I was just chill out, but then the after Blackpool, everybody would head to the Pleasure Beach and have a time at the Pleasure <laughs> Beach. You know, yeah. it was just it was a really really good weekend. Anyway, after <clears throat> sorry, preparing for the 89 Britain, I got banned by NABA and I'd already qualified from the UK. So I was unemployed at the time. I took NABA to court. Um, right. Took NABA to court because, I, well, I got legal aid, but uh, they would stop me from actually um, wanting to, like, winning. The, I, I'd already qualified and I wanted to win the NABA Britain. Yeah. Um, so I got a sports um, barrister in Leeds who actually fought me corner for me, and we were. I had to train for the Britain, not knowing whether I was going to be able to compete or not. Right. Which was a proper head screw, you know, yeah, um, because to get in shape and and also have not having it in my head that all the number of officials had banned me. That am I going to get a fair shout on the day? You know. Yeah. Um, so anyway, the court case went from early in the year through to right up until um, the night before actual the Britain final. Wow. The court, my court appearance was in Leeds against NABA on the eve of the Britain. <laughs> so it was like, well, if I don't get to compete, what am I going to do? You know, like... Okay. Um, because we'd already had the buses booked, we had tickets booked, we had like the guest houses booked. Um, and I just decided, I don't know if you remember the Opera House, you used to have some toilets down the stairs. I, I yeah, decided, yeah, I do remember that. If, if they weren't going to allow me to compete, I was going to get changed in the toilets downstairs. And when the tall class just came on, on, I was just <laughs> going to jump on stage and hit a few. <laughs> just to let them know that I was there, you know, and yeah. I was prepared. Yeah. That's yeah. all. Anyway, um, I went down to Leeds the eve before. I had busloads waiting outside. There wasn't a day when we had Facebook and we could let people know that, you know, the court case was... That wait lag got back. Yeah. So um, I was at the court in Leeds and NABA had sent nobody to defend themselves. They basically all had gone to Blackpool um, uh, to the hotels and set, set themselves up for the next day. So the, the judge um, gave me an injunction to compete the following day. He said, right, well, yeah. that, he says, and plus it's your career. I'm going to give you an injunction to compete. He says, I'm going to get send somebody over to Blackpool tonight. All the NABRA officials will be served with an injunction for you to compete the next day. Right. So I went over to Blackpool full, full chest pushed open, like <laughs> hockey ass and all, you know, no one had one yeah, yeah. to compete the next day. So when I got there on the morning of the uh, event, the, sorry, on the on the evening, the Friday evening, the uh, guy who was serving the injunctions came to the boarding house and said, um, sorry, but nobody will take these injunctions. Nobody will admit to being certain people, you know. And so anyway, my brother says, well, I'll come along and I'll point them all out to you. So he yeah. pointed everybody out and they all got served with the injunctions. So I was, <laughs> I was competing the next day. So anyway, on the morning I got there, there was uh, the... Scottish rep John Clements at the time. He was a friend of mine and he came wandering up just because I was all tanned up and I had my tracksuit on, but he hadn't heard that I was competing. So he came in, what's, what's the crack, Eddie? How are you doing? 
I said, oh, I said, what are you doing here? I said, I'm a compi. Oh, oh, but you're not. You know, and he ran off. Anyway, I thought, I thought yeah, but I am. So anyway, we went and sat in the audience, went and sat in the audience, and the the chairman at the time was Tony Sullivan from the Northwest. Yeah. Um, and I became good friends with Tony, but at the time he was the chairman and he was calling the shots. Anyway, I was sat in the audience and I, uh, there was a call out, could Eddie Elwood please go backstage? So when I went backstage, Tony Sullivan stood there and he says, right, he says, you're not competing today. I says, I am like, he says, no. <laughs> He says, he says, no, you're not. He says, we've got an injunction. Um, we've just got an injunction from the High Court in London. And I even remember the name of the judge because it was so ridiculous. Judge Papadopoulos of the <laughs> High Court London has uh, given us an injunction to stop you competing today. He says, serve it. Anyway, he says, uh, we don't have to. I says, you know, we have to serve an injunction. I says, yeah. serve it, or otherwise I'm getting on stage. Yeah. No, I says, you have to serve an injunction. You, you know, that's the way it works. So anyway, I went back to the audience, sat in the audience. About an hour before I was due to go on stage, got another call. Could Eddie Elwood please come backstage? So I said, Mira, will you come back stage with me and witness what's being said? Yeah. So he came back. And he were, uh, Tony Sullivan said the same again. I said, Tony, you're talking through your backside. I'm getting on that stage. I'm competing today. Anyway, they allowed me to compete. I got on stage and I was expecting it getting getting it stuffed up my backside off the judges. Yeah, but yeah. What what I what I realise now is because obviously I'm involved with the um, the hierarchy. Um, there's no um, back room, you know, pats on the back. Oh, we're going to do this. This is what's going to happen. Yeah. There's none of that goes on. It's it's all yeah. fair and square. Yeah. And the actual judges, because I'm a judges chairman, now I pick judges. And I picked judges on the merit. Yeah. Um, the actual judges are not officials. The judges from within each area, so they are usually ex bodybuilders. Right. So they they were more for me for what I'd done, you know, yeah. for, and up to the the uh, federation. And after the event, I had a lot of them come up to me and said, "Good on you. I'm proud. I'm proud of you. I'm glad you did what you did, and you deserve to win all it." And I got honestly, I couldn't believe it when I saw the score sheets. Nine first places that day. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> wow. My mum still has a score sheet of the magazine. She keeps it. <laughs> yeah, she will do. Well, she'll be proud of that. <laughs> so, then, so after that, sorry, I came away from that competition and I got a phone call of one of the judges just after that. It wasn't, wasn't one, sorry, one of the officials, Southeast official, rang me at the gym and said, you will never, ever do anything else with NABA. He says, you're done. And I thought... You know, something I, I've done what I wanted to do. Yeah. I don't need a fight. I'm now going to go IFBB. EFBB mm. was it. Yeah, it was, yeah. Um, so I transferred over, and I didn't expect to win in the first year, actually. You know what I mean? But um, yeah. I competed and got third in the first year. Ian Harrison won that year, actually, 89. Yeah, I did, yeah. And I got third. To was, that, um, was, was it Gary that got second? Gary yeah. got second. The, uh, oh, Gary. His, his second name's just gone out of my head. I had yeah. it. And when I said Gary, it went. Long Wills. He won World's Strongest Man as well, didn't he? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We should remember that, really. And anyway, he got third. And the second year I went back because he had to wait a full year to go again. He did, you know, yeah. so the second year I went back, I was against Mick Theo, if you remember. I do. Uh, Mick Theo was a good bodybuilder, but I'd absolutely cocked me um, last 24 hours preparation up. Somebody right. had. You know, you're still learning. So he said, you need to dry yourself right out. You need to stop drinking water. Just sip on ice cubes. Yeah. But I was loading massive amounts of carbohydrates at the time. Yeah, so you needed the water. And I needed the water. And what what it was doing, which I didn't realise at the time, is I always used to go for a walk around Wembley Market, you know, just to chill myself yeah, yeah. on stage. Yeah. And while I was walking around Wembley Market, I could feel me, me back aching. And I was finding it hard to catch my breath. It was like... <sighs> I, was, I felt asthmatic, you know, right. and I didn't realise to, to to what was going on until afterwards because I got on stage, I couldn't get a pump. Um, I was I was basically my lungs. I felt as I was sucking my lungs inside out. Yeah. I couldn't get a breath. Yeah. There was no veins there, and I came off stage and I said to my mum, I said I've buggered up here. I said my fluids is like you know I need fluids. I need as many fluids as I can get into us now. I yeah. eat two two liter tubs of ice cream right to the nearest health food stall and i bought about 20 isotonic drinks 
Right. And I rammed it all in, and not once did I go and urinate before the evening show. Wow. So wow. it up sponge. And I went back on on the evening time, probably looking stone heavier. Yeah. And John Citroen at the time hadn't been the judge, but he come the night show and he said, I was, I, I was you already not one here. You know, he's like, yeah. like I was just a different physique on the evening time. Right. Both, that was that was the price of messing up, you know. Yeah. It, yeah. Was, a, it was a lesson learned for the following yeah. year. So the following year, I came back for me uh, to try and get me pro card. I went to a qualifier in Nottingham at the Commodore Theatre, I think it was. Yeah. I got third to Linky Wilson and Peter Chapman. Right. And they didn't qualify me. And I was wow. like, oh. So I came away from the show a bit disheartened. Because obviously it was a, there was some big, good heavyweights about. Yeah, 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 there were then, yeah. They were all like professional looking, you know. Any one of them could like get up and win, and it was it was such a close. Yeah, because he were really he were really good that year, wasn't he? I remember Ian Wadley being really good that yeah, year. Ian Wadley was good. Yeah, um, yeah, but there were so many on that stage it that worked, could have yeah. won that year. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, I'd gone to the Commodore Theatre. I got third. Now I was a bit down. I knew I wasn't hundred percent though. And me dad, me dad was saying, right, I think you're burnt out. You've done too many shows. I think you need a rest. You need to take the year off. You need to just pack some tissue on. Take the year out. Just, I went, no, I'm not doing it. <laughs> um, yeah. I can get right for the final. And he was like, yeah, but you've got to qualify. So in six weeks' time, I did the area qualifier. A lot sharper, but I was only heavyweight that turned up, so I still qualified. Yeah. Um, I brought the house down, and I carried on getting better and better for the final. But I went to every area for qualifier just to check this, the competition out yeah the check final. Out. and i just and i knew what i had to do and I, basil basil francis did it that year uh, uh wadley um armory francis yeah. there was such a mass of like yeah. uh, link yeah. wilson there was yeah. like probably 10 bodybuilders on that stage and probably six i would have said were capable of winning that competition oh, that yeah. yeah and i would not have argued if i had to get in anywhere in that top six or whoever had won that top six yeah i, would never, I wouldn't have argued the toss yeah because there were, it was that good a competition yeah i i was surprised that i won it but you looked incredible that year though didn't you yeah yeah I, I did get it right that year but like i said it was it was still a surprise because i'd seen so much class on the stage and i just thought well i couldn't have won it after not qualifying earlier yeah, earlier, yeah i yeah. couldn't have won it in better company you know, so I'm sorry to break you off. I don't know if you remember the guy, but um, we had Eddie Abu on the other day, and I was talking yeah. to him about it, and he remembered him straight away. Before you won that final, I were kind of a kid really coming into it and things then, and yeah. there was a guy that won the 90 kilo class called Herman Jimenez. I don't know if you yeah, remember Herman him. Was good as well, yeah. yeah, and he, when he qualified, yeah. I remember talking to a couple of judges, just guys that I knew, and they said, the heavyweight is going to be, have to be bang on if Herman is bang on because he could yeah. actually take the overall because he was incredible. He was, um, yeah. But obviously, you, you, you on the day, you were better, weren't you? But um, he was incredible for a 90 I, kilo man. I think, um, I, was, I, I know I wasn't carrying what I was eventually, but even at the time, I was carrying a lot on me free. You were, yeah, huge, yeah. For a tall guy to stand next to a shorter guy who's only 90 kilo. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, definitely. It, I'm not saying I dwarfed anybody, but a big bodybuilder always looks better against a oh, short bodybuilder on stage. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and that's, that was the only thing. I believe Herman had probably better balance than me. You know what I mean? But mm, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I, what, when I, I actually, I told this story the other day with Eddie Abu, actually, because he said what happened to Herman. And I went to a show a year later at Torquay. I'm yeah. telling the same story, but I was, going, I was literally going, coming out of the toilet and someone bumped into me. Mm. And we both said sorry. And when I looked at him, and you know when you recognise someone in face, but you can't point them? And he actually said to me, he says, you know who I am, don't you? And I said, I don't, but I recognise you. And he went, I'm Herman Jimenez. And I actually remember just going, yeah, all right. <laughs> and he went, no, I am. And no word of a lie. He was like a pen. Never. He lost everything. He didn't even look like he'd ever trained a year later. And I just says, what, what happened? Have you been poorly? And he just said, he says, we've had a baby. <laughs> that, oh, that, that yeah. Was it. yeah, people's He's priorities change over time. 
Yeah, it's yeah, like, absolutely. I could never see myself at the time. I could never have lost that much because I used to see bodybuilders going up and down so quickly. Yeah. In yeah. like six month period, and I was thinking, I could never lose that much weight in six months if yeah. I was in, you know, because yeah. but a lot of my gains were made from heavy lifting. Yeah, you did super heavy. It makes a massive difference, don't it? I lifted a lot of weight over them the years, you know, and yeah. like, I, I mean, people used to ask me what my poundages were, and like, I do incline bench work. 500 pound for six to eight reps and i'd take it off the rack and rack yes. it back myself yeah which is crazy. I was flying with like 140 pound dumbbells yeah it's you know what i mean I, I was crazy strong i used to clean uh for press behind that i used to clean a barbell off the floor with 150 140 uh, kilo one and do six reps behind the neck yeah yeah I used to do silly weight, um, but it was all when, when you did the strongman, one of the qualifiers that were on TV, yeah. the current the commentators couldn't work out how you were pressing the weight in a bodybuilding fashion without That's using the body, and, using and, yet, and you were stronger than everybody else. But yet they were using everything to get it up and down. It were it was crazy, yeah. absolutely crazy. I remember the, that. The problem I had is that I did uh, as much as I was strong in the gym. Um, eventually, going into strongman with all them years of strict training and, and me yeah. ligaments, the muscles were used to precise reps that they would to, to try and handle such weight in um, quick, jerky, cold yeah. movements, yeah. You, you, it was inevitable you were going to get injuries. Yeah. And that's what happened really. Because like I so said, I tried to, I, I wasn't that I was trying, I was that used to lifting weight in yeah. the correct fashion. Yeah, absolutely. I, I was trying to do the same with these weights, you know, yeah. where, yeah. Oh, a bit detrimental. Yeah. Yeah. So then, yeah, yeah, I turned pro um, and I thought I'm going to do every pro show I can uh, just to get my face on the scene. Every yeah. pro show I can as quickly as I can. My first pro show, I won the um, the championship in 90, um, 91. Yeah. AFBB uh, in October time, I think it is, October time, 91. By February, I was doing the Arnold Classic. Okay. And I got the invite through uh, Diane Bennett, Wag Bennett's daughter. Yeah. She had a magazine called Bodybuilding Monthly, and I used to write for it, you know, and I did it all free of charge. I just loved, I loved doing articles for her. Yeah. I used to write for Bodybuilding Monthly, putting articles together, and she says, was, have you thought about, sorry, no, I did a show in Ireland just before Christmas. It was like a European type, you know, it was mainly Irish versus the English, but like they call it a European show. Right. Uh, and Diane came up, she says, well, have you thought about doing the Arnold Classic? I said, oh, I wouldn't get an invite for that. She says, I'll get you an invite. I know Arnold. I said, uh, can you? She said, yes. Yeah. She said, I'll get you an invite. <laughs> so I was, so uh, she says, um, I'll get, so uh, she'd get in touch with Arnold. I said, yes. So then she says, Just give us a number to get in touch with Jim Lorimer. Um, so I'd arranged it all, and I think I pissed off, um, I forgot what you call him, it's the guy who was running that IFBB, uh, Wayne Demilia. Oh, yeah. For not going through the right channels. Right. Because there's only 20 people actually get invites to the Arnold Classic. Okay. Or I'm the Columbus one. Yeah. So for me, not to really qualify as such as like you know, like just be coming in the back door. Yeah. <clears throat> I don't think I, I rest. and that's the only thing I can look back on and think what I'd done wrong. It wasn't done wrong, but like you know what maybe it's, because I'd come back from that competition, and I'm not saying I deserved a win or, or no. deserved a place at that competition, but I did, yeah. definitely deserved maybe to be top fifteen, and I've got no yeah, winning. Mom, yeah. 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 Yeah, so I, I remember on the evening time they used to have a banquet, and uh, in that banquet was like a sectioned off area in the middle for all the bodybuilders, the pro bodybuilders, to go and sit so they weren't getting bothered by the crowd. Right. At the time, because it was my first show and I was green as grass, I just said, you know, I'm not sitting in there, you know, I want, I want to sit with the people. You know what I mean? Yeah. I don't want to sit yeah. With everybody. Yeah, and I got a lot more support that way because people were coming up to us and saying, you know, we thought you'd done really well today. You know, your first show, and um, we thought you might have placed in the top ten. You know, I got a lot of positive support yeah. and and good feedback from people. Um, yeah. And I've I've never put myself above anybody else. It doesn't matter who yeah. anybody is. I'm I'm just a 
a normal day to day guy, you know what I mean? Yeah, Who yeah. was yeah. a passion for bodybuilding or had a passion for bodybuilding, then strongman. But yeah. the, I didn't do it for arrogance or tr to be anybody's. Oh. Special. It was a personal challenge. Yeah. Everything to me was just personal challenges. I didn't, yeah. I didn't strut about the gym with me kit off, you know what I mean? People used to say, yeah. well, I didn't strut around the towns with me arms sticking out or. Yeah, yeah. I always kept covered up. Yeah. Um, and I didn't want people to see what I looked like before a competition. And like today's, I, I, I'm glad I was in that era, really, because today's bodybuilders and competitors, all they do is post on Facebook do, yeah. and Instagram and social media. You know what I mean? They're just constantly, there's another pic of myself. There's another pic. And it really does me head in. I think, uh, um, I think Dorian would have struggled to be the shadow, wouldn't he, now? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, he found it probably impossible to be able to do that. Yeah, definitely. I don't think it was Dorian's um, attitude either. You know, he wanted to keep out the he way. He did. Yeah, training, yeah. Training in the, out in the shadow, out in the shadows, really. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, preparing and getting yourself ready without the interference of anybody else. Yeah, yeah. You know? And that's that's the the way our mindset was back then. Yeah. Um. And the mindset's totally different now. It's absolutely, yeah, absolutely. It's a completely different thing now, isn't it? Yeah. So sorry, I didn't finish. So when I got back from there, I got a phone call uh, at my dad's gym. My dad shouted us in the gym. He shouted, "Oh, Eddie's wind, Emily, you're on the phone." So I went and answered the phone. I was like, I was thinking, "Oh, I must be going to get some sort of uh, praise or some, you know, yeah. re re recognition for what I'd just done." Um, anyway, he pulled us straight down. He just said, "You never ever go and do anything with the IFBB." And wow. Uh, that's that was the phone call. That was the initial. That was the initial sentence of the phone call. I said, "Beg your pardon." He said, "You've got no arms. You're not going to do anything with the IFBB." Um, so, and I, was, I got off the phone. I said, "Me dad, that guy doesn't like me." I wow. said, um, "And at the time, my arms were weak. They didn't need working on. Um, I'm not. I'm not um, seeing anything different." But being a rookie pro and somebody who was running an organisation was. Was not really the correct way to approach it. I think you should it's have a horrible said, thing, isn't it? Your arms you should say, well. you could have just, yeah, you could have just said, "Look, we think you maybe you've got yeah. a couple of body parts that are weak that you yeah, need to bring yeah, up, definitely. and it should be that, really, shouldn't it? You know, and just basically put your finger up their ass and fuck them off. You know, I'm mean, sorry about swearing. Yeah, no, no, that's fine. Um, but basically, I just thought I'm going to have to work hard to show my uh, keenness here. Yeah. So I just thought, you know, something. I just. People were saying it was at the time, but you need to get out to California and show your face and get there and, you know, yeah. work the... I said, I shouldn't have to. I should get it on merit. You know what yeah. I mean? I'm, I'm not that type of person. I was... I wanted to work and show it in my physique. Yeah, yeah. And each time I, I went to a show, I was getting better. I was still getting it. I was still getting nowhere. And every year, I did the English Grand Prix... For one reason only, to let the English crowd see that I wasn't beyond what you know, because I was coming back from America, I'd done the I'd done the Niagara show, I'd done the Chicago Pro Invitational, I'd done the New York Night the Champions, uh, I'd done um, the French Grand Prix, the Dutch Grand Prix, all these shows that were outside of England. I wasn't even getting a mention in. I wasn't getting a show. In fact, the New York Night the Champions, which was Wayne D'Amelio's show. Before I even said I would pay me own way to go because, like, if if you're getting an invite, you didn't have to pay your own way. They paid your expenses. Right. I even said I'll pay me own way to go because I wanted to show them that I was keen and willing. Yeah. <clears throat> when I, when I got there, there was 35 competitors on stage. That was the show Ian Harrison uh, dehydrated at and was rushed to hospital. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I had actually carried Ian downstairs. I remember it uh, well. Um, and it was horrible to see because I saw the pictures of him in the park for prior, yeah, you know what I mean? Ridiculous, he, was, yeah. he was bang on that year, you know what I mean? He'd have done some damage. Yeah. But anyway, there was 35 competitors on stage, and the stage wasn't wide enough to put everybody on, so they did three rows, three rows of like two 12s and an 11. Right. And I only had to be, happened to be, the third row back in the corner near the curtain. <laughs> yeah, accidentally. <laughs> and I, and I stood there and I just thought, like, surely they're going to rotate the rows yeah, so yeah. you get to the front eventually. Yeah. No, they didn't. 
Oh. They just shouted out whoever they wanted from that number 35 competitors. They just basically pulled them all out to the front and compared yeah. them. So it wasn't yeah. a fair shout. Um, and I came away from that a bit disheartened. So every year, like I said, I did the English Grand Prix to try and you know, show, show willing. Yeah. And then after four years of it, I'd done my final English Grand Prix. I got myself somewhere near like decent for I think I was about 19 and 19 stone four, I think I was at the time. So I was heavy. I was actually three pound heavier than Paul Dillard. Wow. Or was that that was that was that 95? No, that was 95 when Paul Dillard did it, I think. Yeah. And Paul Dillard came on stage, got a cramp in his leg. Yeah. Went straight off, didn't do the posing. Yeah. And on the posing rounds, he beat me. I did a full routine. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <Come on. laughs> yeah. That so really the, the following yeah. year, like I said, I came back and I thought, I think I deserve a fifth. And I got the give us a seventh. Right. Um, I think the seventh just kept me outside the prize money and stopped me qualifying for any, for any Olympia. Right. Um, but. I'd already said before I'd gone to the show, I said, you know something, even if I, even if the Lerra's win today, I'm going back to Nabba. I yeah. said, because I'm not getting a fair shout. No. I'm not, I say, I'm not bulling myself up and saying I deserve no. those. I just didn't feel as I was getting a fair yeah. shout of comparisons and stuff. Yeah. So I just thought, I'm going to go back to Nabba and try and do something with the end of my career, because I felt as though like, the end of my career was cut. I'd lost four years yeah. of training and competing and spending a lot of money and getting nothing for it, really. Yeah. yeah. So I thought, if I go back to Nabra, I'll still win a prestigious title. Yeah. So 96, four weeks after doing the English Grand Prix, I did the Universe in 96, and that was the year um, Sean Davis won. Right. And I got fourth. Okay. I'll, I'll take the fourth, you know what I mean? I don't. Yeah. I, I think I deserved a second, but I, yeah. I'll take the fourth because I'd just come in that year. I knew... I, I knew it was a title I could win. Yeah. So I set my sights on coming back the following year to win it. Right. Um, so I came back in uh, 97. That was the first, my first universe win. And then I just thought, you know, I'd keep myself going for a couple of years, see if I can actually get somewhere near Arnold and uh, Eduardo Kawak's record of four wins off yeah. the trot. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, because that's all anybody's ever done is four off the trot. There's pe yeah. plenty of pe people who won a lot of titles, yeah, being like masters, not in a row, yeah, not in a row. A couple of masters titles, a uh, mister title, a pro title, they haven't been in a row, yeah. So I carried on doing it, and I eventually got to the four in a row, uh, and I'd, I'd matched Arnold's record, but well, it was still, it was still our record because Arnold had won. I think it was two amateur, then two pro. Okay. Uh, or was it three amateur and one pro? I can't remember, but it wasn't. They weren't all pros. Yeah. Um, I'd won four pro off the trot. Actually, they weren't all pro. The last two were pro am, I think, because yes. I had actually took on the area North Britain um, representative's job on at the time as well. So I was proud, right. you know, I actually convinced the committee to make it a pro am. Because I didn't want to be, I didn't want the embarrassment of getting on stage with six pros, winning the pros, and then other people saying, "Yeah, but he wouldn't even won the amateurs," you know? Ah, uh, yeah. Because some, like the amateur universe, you had some phenomenal winners some years. Yeah, yeah. And like sometimes you're getting up, there was like three decent pros, but three shit pros. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And like, I didn't want to get on stage with six pros that weren't of good enough uh, stand yeah 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 so i convinced nabba to make it a pro-am so all the top three amateurs competed with the top three pros on the on the evening time right. and then obviously the the pro prize money was given to the best of the the bunch yeah yeah um so i still won the last two of them as pro -ams. all right and then my fifth win uh, was to try and break the record that was it and once I'd done that record, I basically hadn't lost the hunger. I'd always, I always wanted to do strongman, but I knew that record would stand for a while because yeah, yeah. the prize money's not in Nabba for people to be hungry enough to keep coming back year after year after year. Yeah, yeah. So I knew that that um, five in a row would stand. So I just I pulled away and I just thought that'll stand for a long time. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely.
and then after that you just did the strong man yes yeah, sorry so i went into britain's strongest man um i won my last universe in the november of 2001 and i competed in me in an area britain's strongest man in 2002 right in march april time and then did britain's strongest man but i did it on i didn't have any of the equipment i was traveling down to darren saddler's yard darren runs all the strong yeah yeah yeah, I, I travelled down to Darren Sadler's yard to try the equipment out because I'd never used anything like you know I'd only trained in the gym, deadlifts, squats, bench, yeah. basic lifting. But I was intense and and um, fit with me training because I used to do set for set. I mean, yeah. I used to deadlift with uh, how much was as oh, with three hundred kilo kilo a bar. I yeah. would do with uh, three sets of um, ten. Jeez, without the power wow. suit, you know, I used to. Yeah. That's what I used to rep out with. Yeah, I used to do three sets of ten. Without, I'd, I'd warm up to the three sets, and then with three hundred yeah. k, I'd do three sets of ten. Wow. Um, so my back was always strong. Yeah. Um, my shoulders were strong. My legs were strong. And I was fit. So anyway, they 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 tested me out with stuff like medleys and stuff in the yard, and I was I was. I was fit and strong. So I was running away with it, really. So when I came to the 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 qualifier, I got through the qualifier. I got second in the qualifier to get a qualifier for Britain's Strongest Man. But I'd never used any stones, really. Right. And in in my first few events, in the first year of Britain's Strongest Man, I was leading quite easily. Then on the stones, I tore my bicep. Um, and still try to finish the event, but obviously, um, and the lad who was running in second to me ended up winning that huh. year, Mark yeah. Eilif. Yeah. Mark Eilif won that year. Um, so I had a lot of unfortunate events with the strongman. The following yeah. year, I came back. So, you know, six weeks after that, that Britain's strongest man, Dougie Edmonds invited me to go to Canada as a t in a team event. Um which was six in each team, and there was six teams of six. Right. It was Winnipeg, Canada. So the British team, there was a U Ukraine team, there was a Czech team, you know, the, the Dutch team. There was a lot of good teams there. So they were making it a team event comes single event too. So the man who got the most points won it overall, and the team that got the most points won, won the team event. Right. So, and me and Bill Pittick were winning everything. Um, we, we were, and I'll tell you the truth, this, and I'm, I'm not a drinker, but me and Bill Pitt relaxed. It was in a nightclub. The whole events were in a nightclub. Me and Bill Pitt were getting drunk every night at the bar. <laughs> and not going, we're not going to bed at about four o'clock in the morning, just drinking and just, just enjoying the time there. <laughs> this is, I've never, ever done this before. I've never, ever. Yeah. And I was so relaxed. I was getting up the next day and I was, I was still winning everything. I was thinking, because <laughs> I was relaxed, I think. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, me and Bill were like head, head most, most of the events. Like I'd win the deadlift, Bill would get second. Uh, Bill won the basket circle, I got second. Right. You know, like, but I ended up winning the overall points and the British team ended up winning overall. Um, yeah. and that, was, that, was, um, that was good. And then I went to World's Strongest Man that year. Yeah. The first time I went to World's Strongest Man. And I ended up getting, um, sorry, no, I didn't go to World's Strongest Man that year because I hadn't qualified. But the following year I'd qualified, but I'd done that with injury too because I'd been, I'd been training, I was always training heavier and harder than what the events were going to be. Yeah. Thinking, when I got there, I would just run away with them. Yeah, yeah. Not realising I was overtraining, uh, you know, and I was causing myself little niggles. Yeah. So anyway... The local paper wanted to do a, um, a photo shoot outside the gym, pulling a, a truck. And I went, yeah, yeah, I'll do that for you. What do you want us to do? Well, just harness up and we'll just get a picture of you pulling the truck. Mm -hmm. And it was a, it was a, um, like a, a tow truck that would tow, yeah. you know, vehicles on. Yeah. So, but the bank outside of me gym it wasn't a bank, but it was a slight incline. It wasn't a flat road. So I had to pull it. It wasn't, yeah. you know, a... It was a pull from a dead start. So the guy that had brought it, I knew, 
and I knew that the guy who was driving it was the guy's brother. So I said to him, well, start the truck up. He says, what for? I said, you've got to start a truck up and take the hydraulics off. He went, no, not this truck. It's a modern truck. I was thinking, well, every truck I pull, you've got to start the truck up. Yeah. To release the hydraulics off the wheel to be able to put to, to make the wheels move. Yeah. Because safety feature on it. Once the, the engine shuts, the brake, brake slot. Yeah, 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 yeah. So he said, he said, no, no, you don't have to. Not this truck, it's a modern truck. I said, are you sure? He says, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I harnessed up, and anyway, I felt like a fool because they there to take pictures, and he hasn't got the truck started up, and I'm trying to pull it. And it's and not I'm going like anywhere. Pushing, right? So I'm pulling and pulling and pulling, and my Achilles went. Oh, no. And this was only like four weeks out from the uh, British Strongest Man. So it was a micro and the Achilles. So I could see the purple line across the back of my Achilles, Ouch. but it was it was one of them that I couldn't get on my toes, you know, because yeah, it was yeah. it was opening up every time I got on my toes and started yeah. like running. And I was always good with farmers and medleys and stuff like that, but like I went to Britain's strongest man, not go, not being able to do what I could do. Yeah, yeah. It, like there was a bus pull on that year, it take me time with. There was some medleys that I had to take me time with. And I didn't get. I still got fourth and qualified for Britain's strong for world strongest man. So then I went to world strongest man, and in my first event, which again I'd overtrained for, it was a duck walk and then yeah. six uh, tire flip, and it was uh, I think it was the heaviest tire that had about four hundred and forty kilo tire out of flip. Anyway, I was confident with it because I've been doing tie and I've been doing the duck walk. So when the whistle went, I carried the duck walk. And I put first to put the duck walk down, went into the tire, got the first flip over, went into the second flip, and I felt it was like piano strings going. It was like I felt the, me, the fibers in my arms go. Dut, 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 dut. Mm. So I finished that event. And I said, I said, to my parents, because my parents were there. I said, I've just told me why, sir. And I went, oh, so. so I was done that year as well, yeah. you know. So I'd had a lot, I'd trained really heavy for stuff that I'd get like really. I was really on form, but then ended up getting injury. So it, it wasn't it wasn't it wasn't meant to be, I suppose. No, no, yeah. but it's a shame though, isn't it? When you're that strong, yeah, <laughs> you know, it's a shame though. I mean, people have been sharing some of my recent videos when I carried like 160k farmers and stuff. Yeah. Uh, it's crazy, isn't it? and like when you when I look back, I think that was craziness. You know what I mean? Like yeah, was. people one in each arm. Yeah, and it's, it's just the one you don't break, isn't it? Five really? <laughs> meters in sixteen seconds. Yeah, it's crazy. You know? Yeah, nuts. So if we could then, Eddie, could we go into what was your kind of? I know it's super heavy, but your kind of style of training. So maybe how often each week, and uh, did you, did you train? The failure? Did you stop before failure? What was your? I'm going to give you the whole routine, which works works for everybody, basically. Yeah. yeah. Because I had weaknesses, I had to work out um, how to bring them weaknesses on. Yeah, of course. Um, I was sculpting a balance physique. That's what I needed to do. And, yeah. And there was lacking body parts there. No fault of me on my arms lacked because of all the fast work I was doing with the boxing over the years. Okay. So, because my hands were used to fast, it's like a long distance run. You're not going to build a, a pair of Tom Platt's quads on a long distance runner. No, absolutely. Uh, not. It, 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 you know, it's very hard to do. So, that was a, a disadvantage for me because of what I'd done in my past yeah. uh, in sports. So, everything else but my arms was coming on. My shoulders were slightly under part first, but they came on. Um, but my quads, my back, my chest, um, everything was there nice nice and thick apart from my arms but it, again I think everything overshadowed yeah because I was carrying that much everywhere else absolutely my arms were small though 22 inches but they look small on, on the rest of my frame yeah yeah you know um, and it was just it was one of them where I was I was doing my utmost to get it so anyway I came up with a, a routine and I and I'd, it was after a lot of things and you need you need 72 hours rest between training and muscle groups. So muscle needs 72 hours rest. Yeah. Um, you also don't need to over-train a muscle. So you don't need to involve other muscles in, involved in that muscle. Yeah. Um, you've also got fast and slow twitch muscle fibers. There's two different mm -hmm. types of fibers that work at different types of 
uh, yeah. exercise, uh, with different types of exercise. One works with heavy, one works with light pumping. So I devised an, a routine that would give us the 72 hours rest between muscle work uh, groups. I would work fast and slow twitch muscle fibers. And I would, um, like I say, I'll be training heavy and light on each muscle group. So yeah. on a Monday, I trained six days basically and one day off. Okay. Six days rolled where I did two muscle groups each day. And right. then I had to devise my body up so I was getting that rest. So I did yeah. a heavy leg routine. Yeah. By heavy, I meant I would drop my reps to six to eights and use as much weight as I could. Yes. Um, and just pick three or four different exercises. And then I would do a pump and shoulder routine. So be heavy legs was really heavy. Everything was basically emphasized on just doing legs. And then my pump and shoulder routine was just basically getting the blood into the shoulders, uh, uh, like super setting, triple dropping, yeah. anything lightweights, just getting the blood going and just getting that yeah. muscle working. And it was a quick routine. The pump and side of the routine was quick. So I'd do heavy legs and pump and shoulders. Yes. On day two, I'd do heavy chest. So my, my legs and shoulders didn't interfere with each other. Yes. So I could do them in one day. Yeah. On day two, I'd do heavy chest and pump my biceps. So my chest is a pushing movement. My yeah. biceps is a pulling movement. So they're not interfering with each other. Okay. On day three, I do heavy back. Yeah. So that's a pulling movement and yes. pump triceps. That's the pushing movement. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm doing a pull and a push each day. Yeah. And then, so I've done three days. I've trained my full body in three days a heavy, a light, a heavy, a light, a heavy, a light. And then on the fourth day, I turn it on its backside. I basically do heavy shoulders. Right. Light legs. Yeah. Yeah. Then I do the day five, I do heavy triceps. Sorry, heavy biceps, pump my chest. Okay. Day six, it's heavy back and pump. Sorry, heavy triceps and pump back. Yeah. So, is I've trained each one heavy and light. Yeah, so absolutely. So I was resting between each muscle group. Okay. I've done a push and a pull each day, run like overtraining and, and exercise, overtraining muscle group with two pushes or two pulls. You did, know, you, did, you, did you go to failure ever or did you maybe stay not a failure? Always failure. Always a failure, yeah. 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 Right. Okay. I never so left, what, I never left nothing on the What's that, sorry? I never left nothing on the gym floor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not like today. No, <laughs> People do. Yeah. I, I don't know how many times I've vomited in the gym. Like had a sick bug yeah. out with legs, with other, with back. You yeah. know, training set for set with a training partner. Training partner had to keep up. Basically, as soon as they got off, I got back on, and that oh, stood God. me in good stead for when I did do my strong yeah, fitness recovery rate and and yeah. being fit enough to carry stuff for distance. You know. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, what about nutrition, Eddie? What did you do there? Was it high carb, high protein, low yeah. fat, or body? Everybody seems to be doing it now, or seems to be getting into it now. I wasn't a big believer in um, you didn't. If I, the way I was training was intense, set yeah. for, so I didn't need cardiovascular work. Yeah, aerobic work. No, you don't need to take my body into aerobic state because yeah. I was burning my calories off. I absolutely. needed food. And at that body weight, I needed calories anyway. Yeah, definitely. You know, so I would um, consume in the region of probably seven or 800 grams of carbs daily. Right, okay. About 350 grams of protein. Right. About 50 grams of fat. Okay. So I didn't really count the fats. That was negligible. Because was that I'd... just from the protein you were eating, the fats? Pardon? Was that, were the fats just coming the from the protein you were eating? I was finding yeah. in my normal foods anyway. Yeah, yeah. I wasn't yeah. Adding any fat. Yeah, so yeah. I wouldn't count fat. I would just eat clean foods, but that yeah. would be probably the amount of fat I'd have in. For instance, like people nowadays, oh, I eat 20 egg whites and one yolk. You know, bollocks to that. I used to eat Absolutely. one egg. Yeah, because I have this discussion all the time where. They'll, we've said this a million times, haven't yeah. we? It annoys the hell out of me where t these guru guys or whatever you want to call them, they'll remove everybody's whole eggs. Yeah. But then they'll have them put six tablespoonfuls of peanut butter in. Well, well the whole eggs, way better than the peanut butter. These are people, who've never, it it, these are people yeah. who've never experienced it or dieted for a competition. Yeah. Or if they have, they end up looking like a bag of shite. Because <laughs> they just 
they've yeah. been they've been getting the calories from peanut butter. Yeah. But yeah. I with every yolk you're throwing away, you're throwing three grams of protein away as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, three and grams good of there's you know, some good fats. Yeah, absolutely. You know I mean? yeah, there's, absolutely. Some, there's a lot of good nutrition in the yolk. So yeah. I used to have all the yolks. I used to eat maybe eight eggs in the morning for breakfast. Yeah. And I'd, one thing I did not do was, was oats. Right. Um, and I always found it very, very beneficial getting ready for a competition. I used to go gluten-free. Uh, yeah. For the simple reason is when you're getting ready for the competition, the amount of gluten in your body binds to – if you've got overload of gluten – it binds to estrogen. Yes. So, and, and at a time when you're cycling, yeah, creating an imbalance of uh, male testosterone and est estrogen. Because yeah. if you take some synthetic male hormone, yeah, then that the natural level of estrogen is going to come up in a balance in Absolutely. a ratio. Yeah. So that's where you know when you stop the male hormone and it drops that like, still a high level of estrogen there. Yeah. You end up getting female characteristics with the bitch tape and other things, you know. Yeah, yeah. So basically, if, you, if you're eating a lot of gluten, it's going to bind to that estrogen, holds it in the body longer, so you get more water retention, just like a woman yeah. would do at the wrong time of the month. She gets more water retention. Okay, okay. So eliminating the gluten out of your diet... Yes. ...gets rid of a lot of the estrogen. Right. Yeah, yeah. So, I, so pe people, I think they look at us a bit strangely because I used to do Rice Krispies... Or okay. cornflakes. Yeah. I used to do cornflakes quite a lot. Yeah, quite a, yeah, I used to. I used to use just enough skim milk just to wet them. Yes. And a bit of candorel just to sweeten them. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. That was me a big bowl, hundred grams, you know. Yeah. Get yeah. close to the closer to the competition, I would change them and just use pure baby rice. Right. Right. Yeah. So like rice flour is easily it's digested quickly. Yeah. I'd yeah. Eat box of baby rice and I'd be starving like half an hour later, you know. <laughs> yeah. My metabolism was higher than that greatly. I'm going to give you a basic of what I could eat even three weeks out from the show. So cool. I'd go in the morning, I'd have eight yeah. full eggs, 100 yeah. cornflakes. Right. I'd then go to the gym to do my first body part. Yeah. I'd be working at the gym anyway, but I'd do my first body part not long after. <clears throat> I'd finish... Uh, me body part, I'd have 100 grams of maltodextrin in a drink. Right. So that's 100 grams of carbs just to get yeah. the glycogen levels back in. Yes. After just depletion. Yeah. Um, then probably half an hour, 40 minutes after that, I'd have me protein shake, which would probably have 60 grams of protein in. Yeah. With creatine, glutamine, um, HMB, other ingredients, you know, but that was a really nutritious protein drink and two yes. bananas. Right. So wow. 60 grams of protein, two bananas, lots of other different things. Yeah. Um, and then mid, mid uh, lunchtime, I'd send somebody out to get us a rotisserie chicken. Yeah. And I We all did that a lot then, didn't we? You don't see people doing that. We all did that a lot then. You don't see people doing that anymore. But the rotisserie chicken, obviously you wouldn't eat the skin and everything else, yeah. but that flavor, you know, so I'd eat the rotisserie chicken, the dry breasts, and I let the staff eat the rest. Yeah, you know, the legs mm. and yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, eat the whole dry breast of the rotisserie chicken. Then mid afternoon, I'd have another sixty gram protein drink, two bananas. I yeah. might even have another carb drink later on before training. Okay, the body part. Um, and then when I got in on the evening time, I'd have a, a, a like some steak, some red meat with boiled potatoes and salad. Right, and the protein shake before bed. Right, okay. Um, and sometimes if I was, if I was, because I, again, I was, I stuck with the same diet for all year. It didn't yeah. matter whether I was competing or not. My diet never changed. So did, did your foods never change? I know you say you did the gluten-free for the diet, but did you? My did, foods did... never changed. I got used to them foods and my body yeah. got used to them foods and my yeah. body got used to digesting them foods. Yeah. The only thing is off season, if I fancied a burger or a pizza or a Chinese, that was as well as. Yeah, yeah. You know, it was just that was me excess calories. Okay. They were as well as so I ate all so I wasn't craving anything and it was easy to get back into my diet. Yeah. So just put me Chinese, me burger and whatever out. They just went by the way so I was back into my diet again. You know, it was Did you drink a lot of water, I did. I didn't drink a great lot of water, no, not back then. I did when I was carb loading. 
I mean, yes. I'd go through carb loading, I'd do five litre, uh, um, a gallon and a half of water every day. Because don't you think the water thing's got a bit out of control now as well? You uh, know, the amounts that they're selling you to drink. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, yeah, it's when they're t- telling you to go, five litres was really as much as you needed. I mean, the, the recommend now, <laughs> they're telling people now to do a gallon and a half a day, just yeah. normally. You know, no. you, how you get your food in when you're drinking. No. Yeah. And, and it would just lie heavy on your stomach. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Oh. What about supplements then, Eddie? I know you mentioned a few there. You mentioned one that I use, I use periodically, HMB. A lot of people yeah. don't believe in it, but I think it's a pretty good supplement. I use, honestly, supplements, I was like, people you say, you must use a lot of gear. I wasn't a gear abuser. I, I was yeah. a supplement user. It's all okay. about, because people used to say, What's the secret then? Expect me to say some fantastic new uh, synthetic steroid or something. You know, obviously, it's the secret's food, it's nutrition. Yeah, absolutely. And until you learn that, you ain't going to get nowhere because no. the gear, it doesn't matter how much gear you take, if you haven't got your nutrition right, if you haven't got the building blocks there to build, you ain't going to grow. Yeah. You know, everything's got to be right. And I used to, I used to use it like um, an example. When you put a key in a lock, every tooth on that key's got to fit to be able to turn that lock. Yeah. So if you're missing sleep, if you're missing the food, if you're missing something, there's a key missing, it's not going to turn. Yeah. You need everything in a balance, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And the gear, yes, it works, but only in support of nutrition. Yeah. Again, you can't tell people that nowadays, though, can you? No. Because the is everything now. Bottle you know. Is bottle. Yeah. That's why, like, like people say, how come there were so many big guys back in your day? Because the gear was better. No, not because the gear was better, because they all trained harder. Absolutely, mate. Most important they fact. They were more disciplined, you know, yeah. they didn't have the distractions of today. Yeah. You know? um, yeah. So, because quick one. probably their only distraction. Yeah, true. <laughs> so, a quick one then. So, you, you mentioned sort of glutamine, creatine. Yeah. HMB, was there anything else to use like a multivitamin or? You always that- use branch chain every day, lots of branch chain. Okay. Um, pre and post workout. Yeah. I used to get plenty of branch chain in because when you when you basically work and out, your body's breaking down branch chain aminos all the time. So yeah. I always just try and get at least four grams of branch chain back in. Okay. I used to use a nighttime supplement called arginine pyroglutamate. Yeah, uh, yeah, which was a growth hormone releaser. But what they didn't tell you was, I mean, it was advertised as growth hormone releaser, and it was expensive. Yeah. But, um, but I was sponsored at the time by All Sports, a supplement company from Doncaster, and I got as many supplements as I want. I never got any money off anybody, but supplements, I got as many supplements as I want. Yeah. And I knew arginine pyroglutamate was a growth hormone releaser, but it didn't work. I would say in the tub, they used to say, "Oh, take three capsules before bed," because you, you're paying for 120 capsules. Yeah. So, you know, and the tub at the time might have been 12 to 15 pounds for a little tub, yeah. which was a lot of money back then. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so to buy that and your protein and your vitamin C and your vitamin E and your zinc and your multivitamins and uh, yeah. just the list was massive. Yeah. Um. So anyway, my pyro- arginine pyroglutamate, I used to use, uh, well, I read upon it, and you needed six to seven grams of it to work as a growth hormone releasing amino. Yeah. So that's what I used to do. I used to use um, like at least a dozen capsules before bed. Right. A milligram capsules. So I'd have six, 12, 500 gram capsules with a B6, a vitamin C and a B complex. Yeah. Yeah. So what about um, if we could then going on to the dreaded thing, yeah. the gear situation, and you know, obviously we're not recommending that to anyone, but yeah. What yeah. was kind of typical for you? Because people will want to hear that and they won't believe it, I'm sure. But, uh, the, you know, a, what was kind a, of typical? A, a typical cycle for me would be 12, maximum 16 weeks. Okay. And, I was, and, I was, and the way I used to say it to people was, if I was doing two 12-week cycles a year, because people now do like, oh, I'm on, on maintenance, I'm on, I've never been off for five years, and I'm like, what? You know what I mean? Um, yeah. It's crazy, isn't it? It's absolutely crazy the way people think and do now. I used to, do, if I was doing two 12 week cycles a year, that was half a year I was on gear. Yeah. And that, yeah. And it was, that was like, you know, long enough. Yeah. It was long enough. Yeah. So I used to try, yeah. to, and I used to say to people, 
it's like it's like it was expect explained before. It's about nutrition. Yes. The the gear is only going to assist the um the nutrition. exactly nutrition is going to assist like the vice versa. Um, so if you take a, a level of gear, so, sorry, I used to split me twelve weeks up into three different cycles. So I okay. use something for four to six weeks. Yes, we both part of the cycle, which would take us up to a, a certain level. But at the six week mark, your body's already getting used to that steroid. Yeah. You know, you only get eight weeks out of any steroid, really, because it's like right. your receptors is done. So at six weeks, I'd taper it out. Or right. four weeks of that. So at six weeks, I'd start tapering that one out. But at four weeks, I'd start introducing another one. Okay. So, so where I was reaching a the peak, then that one started leveling out. I was bringing another one in to carry yeah. on. Con- and when yeah. that one was reaching a peak, I'd level that one out and bring another one in. So I was getting basically small plateaus and just yes. keep climbing one. Okay. Uh, then at the end of it, I used to do my PCT with, um, I'd do uh, 100 milligrams of uh, clomid a day for 10 days. I'd yeah. do 5,000 IU shot of HCG immediately after the clomid. And then another one the following week. And then I'd do B12 injections for a month. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah. And that used to get me somewhere near. Yeah. Um, I was a big believer in using clenbuterol six weeks prior to recital because it used to open the receptor sites up. Right. Start working. So I'd okay. start well, six weeks out, but you just use it every other day. Yeah. Just get my receptors open fresh. And was there like a limit that you'd go to, you know, With, of how much, of just of anything, you know, anything. was the sort of. It's not about the amount of gear, it's about yeah. the nutrition. Um, yeah. It's like like kids now using clenbuterol. They think more is better, and it's not more is better because like clenbuterol, you can take it'll only get your body to a certain temperature, and then it peaks off. Yeah. So you can carry on using more and more. You're just wasting your money. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know? Yeah, I get that. But, yeah, the guys, you get to a certain temperature. Once that temperature is reached, don't carry on buying more in. It's just like you're wasting your money. So for the show, did you just maybe change to more fast acting? So basically, I'll I'll give you I'll give you a, a basic rundown. Yeah, I'll do um, a train, a boldenone, and a test sipionate. Okay. Um, so it was a three mil Monday, and, uh, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Okay. Yeah. With um, say four to six oxys. Yeah. And um, two. 20 milligrams of stanozole. Yes. Keep the blood thin. Because oxygen used to, obviously, you get like um, high blood pressure off the oxygen, but the stanozole used to thin your blood back down. So okay. You, okay. You, yeah. So I used to use a couple of, every time I used oxygen, I'd use stanozole. Okay. And I'd use them for the initial growth phase. Yeah. Then probably um, Peter off that and go on to um, uh, Masteron with uh, maybe. Um, I'm trying to think. You no, know, Mastron, Test of Iron, and uh, maybe it's Decker or something. Just yeah. like or okay. just something in the middle, and then I'll keep the Mastron in and just bring in Prima Bolland, Probionate, yeah, uh, Anavar towards yeah. the end. Okay, uh, and Halitessin if I go Garrett. You know? Yeah. I'll yeah. just start to get at the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. Um, that would basically be my cycle. Oh, if I was using any growth, I would save it for the last six weeks because it was too expensive to buy. Okay. What about you know, like Italy? Is people use growth hormone like it's going out of fashion. Oh, like, I know, mate. I know. I, know. I didn't start using growth hormone until I got my pro card. Okay, okay. What about the insulin thing? Did you I ever do that? I once and it's not, it wasn't for me. No. Um, a lot I, of people say I, that. I tell, Experiences with insulin, and again, it's not really safe. And I, I, and I, it's the same as any other drug. You start using too much of it, it's going to shut your own production down of insulin, and you're going to end up being insulin dependent. Yeah. Um, so I tried it. I tried, tried it twelve units, which was a minute, minute amount, um, really compared to what some of the pros were doing at the time. And I only took up on it because the pros were doing it. And a lot of the pros were doing like 60 units in a day just so they could ram a load of shite. You know, they were just <laughs> back. Yeah, yeah. But, 
Um, and I thought, oh, I'll, I'll give it a try because they're all saying that's what you get big on. And I give it a try, and every time I tried it, because my metabolism was already fast, yeah, I would hypo. Okay. I'd hypo within an hour of using some insulin, not like into a coma. I would just just profusely sweat. Yeah, it's just not right, is it? It would just drain drain the life out of us, and I would end up having to eat anyway, but not yeah. feel good. So I, st- I never used it really. Okay, so just kind of coming to a last thing, because we always try and cover this for people now, so the crazy things that go on. Your sort of peak week, I know you mentioned that the water thing made a big difference for you. What what was yours? Did you carb deplete, load? Or... Right, so carb depletion, you've got, to get, you've got to get into a context that when, when I was at, at, at my peak, my last competition, I was 20 and a half stone on stage rip. <laughs> Right, okay. Universe, I was 20 stone seven on stage in condition. Right. To maintain that type of body weight and that muscle, you need calories. Yes. So my, I always got in shape, say, four weeks out from the competition and maintained from there. Yeah. But I wanted to be full and tight for the day of the show. Mm-hmm. So I, I was always in shape, like I say, the, the four weeks out, and I just had to play about with it. And I always used to say to people, if you get in shape somewhere like four weeks out, you can play about with your carbs, you can play about just by 25 grams. 25 grams a day is only 100 calories. Yeah. 25 grams of carbs. So if you increase each day 25 grams to see where you're at, as soon yeah. as you see that film of water going under your skin, you know you'd knock back 25 yeah. grams. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, you can keep yourself balanced. It's okay. not a case of like panicking. You keep yeah. yourself balanced over the four weeks. Yes. So 10 days out from the show, that was my depletion time. And you deplete because of one reason is because you want to force more water tissue into the muscle when you start carb loading. Because yeah. for every gram of glycogen that's held in the muscle, it holds on two molecules of water. Yeah. For every molecule of glycogen holds on two molecules of water. Yeah. <clears throat> when you deplete and carb load for a limited period of time, each molecule of glycogen can pull four molecules of water. Yeah. It's only for that limited period of time. So what I used to do was, and to stop burning muscle tissue, as you would, I would start 10 days out, so it took a week to drop me carbs and three days to load. So 10 days out, I'd go from 800 grams of carbs to, so, so that would be done over five or six days. Five or six days, I'd drop from 800 grams of carbs down to 75 grams on the last day. Okay. If yep. I didn't maintain my calories, my muscle tissue would burn up so much. Yeah, energy. yeah. Yeah. Them that, yeah, that week. Yeah. So, because my body had been used to that many calories, I had to, so basically, you start dropping the carbs daily. So, if I dropped 100 grams of carbs, this is just an example. If I dropped 100 grams of carbs each day, I'd have to introduce uh, 50 grams of fat. Yes. To make up for the calories that I was losing. Yes. For every two, because there was twice as many calories in fat grams. Yes. Carbs. So every 100 grams of carbs I burnt, I, I dropped out, I introduced 50 grams of fat. And I did that with almonds. Okay. So I, I did, I'd end up chewing a load of almonds through the day, you know, just eating yeah. almonds. A lot of people can do with almond butter and stuff now. Yeah. But I was doing it with almond nuts because I found yes. it like the roughage in the hook, you know, just felt, okay. felt a bit of holes meeting them. Yeah. So I would drop from 800 grams of carbs down to 75 grams of carbs. Right. And that 75 grams of carbs on my last day was just enough to get me through my last workout to be totally depleted. Yeah. So I'd get up in the morning, I'd have my 75 grams of baby rice, and I'd go to the gym and I'd burn that off in a full body workout on my yeah. like, last day of training. Yeah. My full body workout would be picking two exercises per muscle group. I'd use uh, like 15 to 20 reps each muscle group, slow and squeezed, just burn all the glycogen out of every muscle tissue. Yeah. Um, and then I'd be absolutely ruined by the time I'd finished it all because I'd do a full body work. I'd put, like, yeah. say, only two muscle groups and only 15, 20 reps each muscle group. Um, and then immediately after that, I'd have 100 grams of carbs. And then every hour after that, every throughout the day, there'd be, like, probably 70 grams of carbs, you know, like, oh. just... The initial 100 grams was because I was that low, I would absorb it. Yeah, 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 yeah. But then throughout the day, I'd have to lower them slightly just to yeah. keep them going in without getting too smooth. So it was probably about 70 grams of carbs each carb meal yeah. towards the end of the evening, um, but every hour. 
Then day right. two, uh, you'd wake up the next morning flat as a pancake. Even though you'd, <laughs> yeah. the carbs, you'd wake up flat as a pancake. You'd urinate all the water off. I'd have drank five to six litres of water that day too. And I'd right. urinate all that water back off. Yeah. So you wake up the morning thinking, well, where's it all gone? I was vascular as hell last <laughs> night. I was like, you know. So you have to start that process again. So you start doing it again. But I don't, on the second day, I don't do it every hour. I was doing it every hour and 15. Because the process does slow up a bit. And I think yeah. that's what I learned anyway of yeah. my own body. If I started doing it every hour, I would I would overspill. Yes. But I did every hour for three days, I'd overspill. So it would be every hour and a half, every hour on the first day, yeah. every hour 15 minutes on the second day. And on the third day, I'd get up again. You'd be flushed out, dry, but like no carbs in you, like empty again. Yeah, yeah. I'd yeah. drag them back in. So for the first, if I was going on stage at three o'clock in the afternoon, I'd do for the first six hours, I'd do every hour. Right. Get them back in again. Yeah. Then I'd slow them up to every hour and a half. So my stomach wasn't going to be bloated and yeah. be, you know, yeah. every hour and a half towards the stage. And then just an hour before stage, I'd have some simple sugars, you know, some yeah. uh, natural fruit jam without uh, just uh, normal fructose in. Um, yeah. I'd, I'd eat a jar of natural fruit jam or something just before yeah. going on. Okay. Okay. What about the water and salt? I I was a big believer of sodium loading. Okay. I've suffered with diuretics the same as everybody, and diuretics is more disadvantages come from diuretics than anything. Yeah. Um. So uh, uh, if you're already in shape for sure, which I said I was four weeks out, and then you think, oh, the night before, I think if I just took a diuretic. Yeah. <laughs> Drop a couple of pounds, yeah. tank yourself back up. But a diuretic can take half a stone off you. Yeah, yeah. Can take ten pound off you, really. Yeah. And and I'd say to people, if you're already in shape, because I'd suffered them, I'd suffered yeah. all that before. Yeah. Because it's all down to experience. I'd say to people, if you're already in shape, why would you want to take a diuretic? Yeah, yeah. If you weigh seven or ten pound of meat out and put it on the tail, and look at that. And that's what you've lost over, like you could that's have correct. lost overnight. That density is not going to come back in that quick. No, no. So you end up on stage flat and listless, you know. Yeah. Like, so the the disadvantages of using a diuretic was far outweighed. I think on, on lesser bodybuilders who were just starting out in competition, the better off getting on stage ripped and like a, you know what I mean? Like, yes. Than they are getting up big and round and smooth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But as you get that density of tissue, you need that density of tissue to be full. Yeah. You can't rob it because it looks worse. Yeah. You yeah. know, so I tried aldactone um, and it used to rub too much off us. And I used, like, a week after the competition, I was always in better shape. And I used to look at myself, why wasn't I look like this on stage, you know? Yeah. Uh, so I stopped using diuretics in my last probably four year of professional competition, never used a diuretic. Okay. So I did do sodium loading, which is not really good for your kidneys, but it works. Yeah. Okay. So if you're in shape, it only works if you're in shape again. Yeah, exactly. Basically, if you start building up from, when you start depleting your, your carbs, if you start introducing sodium daily and increase it from two and a half grams to your last day of depletion, where you're on um, 14 grams of sodium. Right, okay. Your body is basically, you've got, you've got to have the balls to do it because basically the first time I ever did it, I stopped four days in because I didn't like what I was seeing. I was flushing out. And yeah. within a year, I'd be, I was ripped to bits. So it gives right. us the confidence to do it the next time. Yeah. But the next time I did it, like I said, it's two and a half grams and basically all the way up to 14 grams on your last day. Um, and I was you flushed out. Then what you have to do is basically not touch anything with sodium in. You're basically brushing your teeth with distilled water. You're not touching toothpaste. Yeah. The sodium in the toothpaste. You're basically just brushing your teeth with distilled water. You're coating your meals with distilled water. You're is that the last three days that I did? Last three days. Yeah, I know. And you're taking in potassium, calcium, and magnesium to, to create a better balance for the water. Yeah. Because if you don't create that balance, you end up getting a lot of cramps. Yeah, of course, yeah. So you need a six four two uh, balance of like potassium, calcium, and magnesium um, in that proportion. Yeah, you take in them supplements as well as the water, 
and you're taking in the carbs and basically you do you absorb everything and you're getting yeah. dry the time. You, you you don't stop you you're urinating off what's beneath your skin yeah yeah okay yeah. so just just a quick one finalize then so did you use like sauces and things off season but maybe then yeah, didn't yeah. before the contest yeah I'd, um, I used to love um, with my scrambled legs, like off season, I always had plum tomatoes. Um, yeah. uh, I used to use a lot of herbed plum tomatoes in my pastas yeah. and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and my rice dishes. I used to use a lot of Uncle Ben's sauces in my rice dishes. Yeah. I, you know, I, I used to flavour my food. I wasn't bothered. Yeah, absolutely. I was just thinking when you, when you said you introduced the sodium, had you not had a great deal of sodium during the prep? No, or I did... used to just use sodium as and when. It yes. wasn't the case of, I, I limited it. Yeah. I think yeah. because I did sweat a lot, and I, I like I said, me, me routines, me training regimes were intense. Yeah. I used to use a lot of sodium. Oh, you know, okay. okay. In, in me workouts, I used to, I used to profusely sweat a lot. A lot. You need it, don't you? Mm. You know, I think sometimes when people are fatigued, it can be that they've lost quite a lot of sodium rather than necessarily it's carbohydrate. It's like PTs who haven't got an absolute effing clue. Yeah. Got, they've got people getting ready for shows on two hours cardio a day. Mm -hmm. um, half the carbs they should be. Yeah. And then, and they're still not getting in shape and they start introducing more cardio and, and less carbs. And I'm like, yeah. Because they don't know where they're going. You've <laughs> yeah. never experienced all that yeah. where yeah. you're going. Yeah. So I'm not going to mention the lad's name, but I got. A, I saw a lad compete the universe one year, big heavyweight, um, and he got sixth. And I thought he could have had a fifth yeah. in the in the tall class. Anyway, he didn't know me, but I rang him up afterwards. No, sorry, I, I Facebook messaged him afterwards, and I said, I'm not going to mention his name, because I don't like <laughs> But anyway, I said, you know, if you want to come over, you know what I mean, I'll, I'll give you some. I, I said, I don't know who, you, who your coach is, but I've seen you better. Um, I, I'm a tall class competitor. I didn't I didn't say who I was or what I was doing. Yeah, I said, yeah. I'm a tall class competitor, and give you some advice if you want some advice. Yeah, he messaged straight back and said, I'm, um, I've got a coach, um, it's such and such, and uh, thanks for the offer, basically. Yeah, so I said, No problem, I, I appreciate that you, you, you know, you stick by your coach and what have you. So, anyway, um, he must have gone away and googled what I'd done. And the same night, he messaged back, he went, uh, Hi, champ, <laughs> he says, uh, <laughs> I'd, like, I'd like to come and see you if that's all right. <laughs> I said, Yeah, yeah, no problem. So, when he came to see me, I said to him, what have you been doing for the universe? And this is a big guy who's, who actually, who was, he was only about 16 and a half stone at the universe, but capable of a hell of a lot more. So at the universe, he was 16 and a half stone soft. He thought he looked good, but obviously that was the illusion in his head. You yeah, know, yeah. He thought he looked the best he'd ever looked. And I said, you weren't, you were soft. You were, you know, your muscle wasn't full. Anyway, um, he says, "Oh, before you go any, before you go anywhere with this, he says I'm carb, I'm carb intolerant." I went, "I've heard all that before." I said, "You're not carb intolerant." I says, "You yeah. just, your body hasn't been used to eating carbs." Yeah, yeah. Did yeah. everybody, everybody need carbs? I says, um, "Yeah, this is the way we made. We made yeah. eat carbs. We made, we're not made to starve." Yeah. I said, "Right." I said, "You've got nothing on, have you?" I said, he says, "No." I says, "Right. What I want you to do?" I says, "Now tell me what you've been doing." This is what he was doing for the universe. He was doing two hours cardio every day. <clears throat> he was doing 50 grams of carbs for six weeks. Wow. 50 grams, of, I think it was between 50 and 100 grams of carbs a day for six weeks. Two hours cardio a day. 200 grams of fat and 550 grams of protein. Wow. And I went, whoa. I Turn that around. <laughs> I said, right, what I'm going to do with you, I said, just so I'm not frightening you, I'm going to keep calories the same. I said, let's knock uh, 200 grams of your protein. I think it was 580 grams of protein. Yeah. Let's knock 250 grams of off there, so you're doing 330 grams of protein. Yeah. I said, so that 250 grams can be transferred to carbs, same calories, 250 grams of carbs you've got there. I said, you also got 280 grams of fats. 
I said, so let's take 130 grams of that fat, which is 260 grams of carbs. That says, and keep your grams of fat at 50. So I says, now you've got 400 and odd grams of carbs, uh, 50 grams of fat, and 330 grams of protein. But I think you need a hell of a lot more carbs. But yeah. I'm not going to write now. What I want you to do this week is just do 300 grams of them carbs because obviously you've been frightened by yeah. carbs. You know, you've only been used to 100 grams of carbs maximum. So he went, oh, uh, he was all, all wary about doing it. So anyway, yeah. he did a week and he rang us up. He said, um, I've lost two pound. <laughs> yeah. The calories are the same. You've had more carbs. You've lost two pound. Mm. But I feel better. I said, you're going to feel better because you obviously your energy. I said, right, increase them 100 grams. Are you sure? I said, yeah, increase 100 grams. So I increased his carbs. So in the November, he completed in the universe about 16 and a half stone. Mm -hmm. By the time he qualified, he got round to the Britain in yep. May, which was about six months, he was 45 pound heavier. Jesus. Wow. wow. That's a lot. And he won the tour class Britain. Wow. You know, that's ridiculous. Absolutely, it was ridiculous. And he thought it was down good gear. I said, yeah. not good gear. I said, it was yeah. just good food. I yeah, said, absolutely. all all you're doing is like you've just started eating again. And he's and uh, and he was happy. Yeah. And that's the thing I did it with my son. My son, he got ready for a junior show, and um, from qualifying at the junior area show he do, he'd done all this in 10 months too yeah qualifying at the junior t area show from then to a month to the britain i had him a stone every in better condition yeah because we knew what we were doing with the food yeah, yeah. you know yeah and it's and it's eyesight i mean people come and see me and i'll and i'll i'll, I'll not pull no punches yeah i'll i'll tell them exactly how it is i don't pull anybody up yeah I'll tell them exactly how it is and like my son his legs were smooth. Yeah. For the area show. Yeah. And his abs weren't as tight. Yeah. I increased his food, dropped his cardio, and he got sharper and fuller. Yeah. He couldn't yeah. comprehend it. No. I said, I've, I've been through all this. I can see it in your physique what you need. Yeah. Your physique yeah. is flat. That's why your legs are not cut. You yeah. have got loose skin and water retention because you've overtrained them. Yeah. Stop cardio, eat more carbs. Yeah. You know, and because I've been there and done it, I can visualize, I can see what's happening to people's physiques. Yeah. If yeah. I'm seeing them on a weekly basis or a monthly basis, even, I, I can basically tell them, you're right, you, I can see you, you're doing too much cardio, or you, you know, you need to stop the cardio. Or you I, I know that because I, again, I, I won't mention names like you haven't, but a couple of my friends that I don't see very often now, yeah. they've been to see you before. You know, yeah. before contests, and and they've come home and they've phoned me and gone, he's changed everything. Yeah. <laughs> and you just go, yeah, but that's what we're required, obviously. Yeah. You know, so you you've got to do it, haven't you? You've got to stick to it. And 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 one of the the hardest things is, listen, so you get some people listening to two different people, and the the, yeah, the, the head becomes yeah scrambled, and they don't know who to listen to. And I've always said, if you're asking me the question, you want me to coach you then I, you've got to switch off from somebody else. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Totally and, agree. And I'm not bullying myself up. I don't, I, I've never bullied myself up that way. But I'll say to them, listen, I won one universe title. Yeah. Then you can call that luck. I win you two universe titles and you can call that coincidence. Mm. And you win three, four and five, you call that a formula, right? Yeah, absolutely. Mm. Absolutely. Yeah. It's it's entirely up to you. I'm not going to criticize you if you want to go elsewhere. Well, yeah. you know, if you listen to what I'm telling you, I'll get you I'll get you where you want to go if you yeah. if you're prepared to put the effort in it. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. All right, mate. Well listen, I don't want to keep you any longer because we've kept you a long time. That's amazing. But I want to tell a right quick story before you go, because I said I would. I um competed in a Latham's Gym Junior show many a year ago. Uh and you were the guest poser. I think I've only ever done one Latham's show. Nutsford, Cheshire. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I was on stage, and my poor dad, bless his heart, was walking up and down, panicking, because all I'd ever done were trained in his garage. Yeah. So he was having a heart attack, and you were the guest poser, and you were stood, and you actually saw him walking up and down, and you said to him, are you all right? 
yeah. and he said, my son's on stage, da 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 And unbelievably kindly, you looked up and you said, which one is he? And you said, and he went, he's, he's got that all day long, yeah. so don't worry about that. And yeah. it, it would just... When we got home, he couldn't stop talking about it because you'd calmed him down straight away. Yeah. So he obviously knew you knew what you were seeing. Yeah. You know, so I just want to say thank you for that. I did thank you on the day, but you'll never remember. Yeah. So I wanted to say thank you again. So yeah. that was brilliant. Thank you for that. Good little story there. <laughs> it's just one my little art there. Yeah, I mean, brilliant. I tell you what, I got home and obviously I'd won the show and things and I felt amazing. And then he told that story and he just said, it just completely settled him straight away because yeah, seeing yeah. you, the size you were and everything, he said straight away, well, he knows what he's talking yeah, about. Yeah, so, yeah. you know, it, it really helped him out. So, thank you so it much. It was all you to your dad at the time. <laughs> yeah. Well, listen, mate, all I can say is thank you so much. Amazing info for everybody. You're a star. And hopefully, if you will, if you've enjoyed it, which hopefully you have, we'll get you on again with these other guys and that'll, that'll be amazing. Okay, no props. That'll thank be good you very much, Ed. And actually... Yeah, it would be great, mate. Well, it'll be a lot of fun. Right, mate, listen, thank you very much. Cheers, bud. Take care. Bye-bye.